Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Lighthouses, License Plates, and Grants, How the Michigan SHPO Helps Protect Our Lighthouses. We're really excited to have you here with us this afternoon. Next slide. Uh, my name is Mallory Bauer, and I have the privilege of serving as the Education and Communications Manager for the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. And today we are joined by Brian Lajeski of the State Historic Preservation Office. We are using Zoom today for our webinar, which I'm sure many of us are very familiar with, but just to orient orientate you to um, the features that we will be using today, um, we will be collecting questions in the Q&A box. Um, so that is uh, in the toolbar, which is likely at the bottom of your screen. You may have to wiggle your mouse a little bit and it'll pop up from the bottom. And there will be two little you know, conversation bubbles and it says Q&A and you can click on that and type in your questions there. We will be saving questions uh, until the end of the presentation, but please feel free to enter your questions as you think of them. And that's a great way for us to keep track of them. Additionally, the chat window will be available and as uh, resources and web uh, addresses are mentioned that you should know about, um, they will pop populate in the chat box so you can copy and paste it for your future use. We are going to do some polls um, just to find out who's here. Um, and so please participate in those when we get to them in just a moment. And there is also a survey that will be available directly after the webinar and will also be sent in our follow-up email that should go out tomorrow or Monday with a link to the recording. And if you could take a moment to uh, provide your feedback on our webinar, we greatly appreciate it because it helps us continue to produce um, excellent uh, educational material for everybody. All right, next slide. And again, we are uh, the Michigan Historic Preservation Network, and we are the statewide nonprofit, and we educate and advocate for Michigan's historic places that contribute to our economic vitality, sense of place, and connection to the past. We are a membership-driven organization, and if you are a member, thank you so much for supporting us. And if you would like to become a member or learn more, you can visit our website at www.mhpn.org. Next slide. And we can thank our generous sponsors who make this possible. We would like to thank our series sponsors, the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, this uh, session in particular has two special sponsors, which we wanna take a moment to thank as well. And that is the Bayview Handiworks and Sme Trombley Architecture. Thank you so much for your support and we greatly appreciate it. All right, so before I turn it over to Brian, we are going to take a moment for the polls before I uh, forget, because that has happened in the past. Um, so first of all, if you would take a moment to um, click the selection um, that best identifies your role in historic preservation. Um, are you a professional, just really interested? Are you a stewarding a lighthouse or part of an organization that stewards a lighthouse? Um, an architect? I'll leave this up for a few more seconds, just so we can find out who is here. All right. I'm gonna end that poll and I'll share our results. So we have our interested citizens and lighthouse stewards. We have some nonprofit organizations and architects and SHPO here, excellent. And then we have one more. Since we are talking about lighthouses, which we are fortunate to live in a state that has so many of these unique uh, resources, how many lighthouses would you say that you have visited? And this can be over the course of um, all your years <laughs> uh, going out and, and visiting. I know I'm looking forward to a lot of the photographs. Um, I know I have a few lighthouses that I tend to see often.
Awesome. All right, we have a, a going to close this poll and I'll share the results. So we have quite a few um, who would say that they have been to far too many lighthouses to count, which is um, amazing. We're really excited to have you here. All right. Well, those were uh, the two polls that we had. Um, so without further delay, I will turn it over to you, Brian. Thank you so much for being here. All right. Thank you, Mallory. Thanks for having me. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. So glad you could join us this afternoon for our webinar presentation on Lighthouses, License Plates, and Grants. Um, as Mallory said, my name is Brian Lajeski. I'm a licensed architect with the State Historic Preservation Office, and I'm very fortunate to be able to work on uh, several of many of Michigan's lighthouses and have vis visited quite a few as well. So I look forward to sharing some of my experiences with you during the presentation this afternoon. Uh, okay, there we go. So I wanted just to start by sharing a little bit of uh, my background with all of you. Um, so in addition to working on lighthouses, I, I've worked on uh, many other historic resources uh, as well. But um, I did grow up in Michigan. I'm from Michigan. I grew up in Bay City. Um, from there, I went to the University, University of Michigan, where I um, received my Bachelor of Architecture degree. Um, and then, of course, being young and wanting to get out, I, I left Michigan and moved to the West Coast to Seattle, Washington for a few years, worked for a private architecture firm. Uh, but then the Midwest pulled me back. Back. And so I returned to Illinois, University of Illinois for graduate school, where I earned a master's degree in architecture uh, with a specialization in historic preservation. Um, and then I worked for the Illinois SHPO for a few years before coming uh, back to Michigan to work for the SHPO. So um, in the course of my career, I've worked on many building types, large and small commercial buildings, large and small residential buildings, um, and even sort of uh, unique object type projects. On the far right of the screen, you see a photograph of a historic street light. This is in the Indian Village Historic District in Detroit. A few years ago, we gave them a grant uh, to restore 137 of these historic uh, street lights. So that was a, a fun project. And then uh, this photo is uh, me with a group of consultants that went out to the Standard Rock Lighthouse in Lake Superior to do some uh, recording work uh, of that structure. So certainly one of the perks of my job is to be able to do site visits and get to go to places that uh, a lot of people don't have the opportunity to get to or to see in person. <clears throat> So I've been with the Michigan Historic Preservation uh, Office for over 20 years. Um, we are a group currently of about 14 historic pre preservation professionals and support staff. Um, in 1966, the National Historic Preservation Act was passed by Congress uh, as a way to promote preservation in our country. Um, part of the uh, provisions of that act were that each state had to establish a state historic preservation office and appoint a state historic preservation officer. So that's kind of how we came uh, into being. We do administer a number of state and federal historic preservation programs. We um, categorize those programs into three main program areas, and those are designation, protection, and incentives. Under our designation programs, we look at ways to identify and um, designate significant historic properties. And we do that through programs like the National Register of Historic Places and Historic Property Surveys. Once we uh, identify significant historic resources, we look at ways to protect them. And we do that through programs like our Section 106 program that refers to Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, which states that any um, project that has federal money or federal license involved, it will go through a review through our office to uh, make a determination on whether or not it's going to have any negative impacts on historic resources. Um, another protection program is our Local Historic Districts Act. That's um, administered at the local level. So protected resources, uh, any work on those resources are reviewed by a local historic district commission. And then finally, we have a few incentive programs to provide financial uh, resources for rehabilitation of historic properties. And those include our federal historic tax credit program and our brand new, just passed at the end of last year, 2020 state tax credit program, which we are currently in the process of developing uh, that program. So stay tuned for more information about that. 
So uh, just a brief outline of what we're gonna cover this afternoon. I'm gonna do a brief uh, lighthouse history uh, and then I'll talk more specifically about uh, Michigan lighthouses and then describe some of the lighthouse programs that we administer here in our office. Talk about our Save Our Lights fundraising license plate and then talk about the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Re Rehabilitation. These are the guidelines we used, use when we review uh, projects on historic properties. And then I've got two um, case study grant projects that we'll uh, look at in more detail about a couple of lighthouses and how um, our grants uh, were applied and used on those uh, historic resources. And then as Mallory said, we'll have time for questions and answers at the end, but feel free to um, ask those questions in the chat as we, as we go along. So at the bottom of the screen here, starting on the left, we have a photo of the Sandpoint Lighthouse in uh, Escanaba. And in the middle, we have the Charlevoix Pure Light, of course, in Charlevoix. And then on the right, we have the Grand Traverse Lighthouse uh, in uh, north of Traverse City in the Leelanau Peninsula. <clears throat> All three um, have received uh, grants through our grant program. So we'll uh, start with a brief lighthouse history, just to kind of put Michigan in the context of the larger um, development of lighthouses and what was happening at the national level. So in 1789, we're gonna go way back to 1789, there were 12 lighthouses on the Atlantic coast uh, operated and maintained by individual states. In August of that year, uh, the ninth act of our first Congress was the passage of the Lighthouse Act of 1789. This act created the United States Lighthouse Establishment. The act transferred those 12 lighthouses into federal ownership um, and it uh, created that oversight at the federal level. There are several reasons for doing this at the time. One of the reasons was to, you know, kind of um, consolidate um, the, uh, the assistance that was being provided by those lights to maritime commerce at the time. So it took a few years for all those lighthouses, those 12 lighthouses to, to be transferred, the ownership to be transferred and to, to Department of Treasury to work things out. This establishment was placed in the Department of Treasury. Then in 1820, the fifth auditor of the Department of Treasury, a man by the name of Stephen Pleasanton, was put in charge of the lighthouse establishment. So starting 1820, he had control over the lighthouse establishment. So Mr. Pleasanton was um, much more of a fiscal guy, a fr frugal guy, and he was interested in numbers, not so um, knowledgeable or interested in quality of building or lights, quality of the, the lights that were being um, installed in, in the country. So he had that financial interest more so than the, the structural or construction interest. So as a result of that, um, many of the early lighthouses that were built uh, in the US were of poor quality and they didn't, some of, a lot of them didn't last very long. Um, there are, there's um, historic documentation uh, explaining the situation at many lighthouses where both the tower and the keeper's quarters were of poor quality construction and uh, some of them literally just crumbled down after, tumbled down after a few years. So that was kind of the, the, um, the atmosphere in which the, the uh, lighthouse establishment got started in those early years. Then toward 18, the 1850s, um, mariners and local authorities were getting very frustrated and complaining uh, about the condition of the lighthouse establishment under the administration of Pleasanton. So in 1852, Congress established the Lighthouse Board, which took over administration from Mr. Pleasanton, the fifth auditor. Um, so at that point then the board, which was made up of mostly military officials, um, was really proactive in uh, advancing uh, lighthouse technology and increasing the quality of construction and how and where lighthouses were constructed. So that was a significant improvement starting in 1852. At that time also, the country was divided into 12 lighthouse districts. So it was thought at the time that those um, 12 districts would be, uh, would allow for more regional control and um, oversight at the lighthouses that were in those individual districts. As part of that, there were lighthouse depots that were built in each of those um, lighthouse districts. And in Michigan, we still have, the buildings still exist. There's one in Detroit and one in uh, St. Joseph, I believe. Uh, also during the lighthouse board, we saw uh, the implementation of more standardized designs for light station buildings um, as a way to um, more efficiently and more quickly uh, build lighthouses. 
1910, there was another significant change where the United States Lighthouse Service was established. This was also known as the Bureau of Lighthouses in the Department of Commerce. Uh, this was run by a single person, a single man. Uh, at that time, it was thought that the board was uh, less efficient, so they placed it under an individual. And that individual was George Putnam, who uh, played that, uh, served in that role for approximately 25 years. And he was a well-liked, well-known guy. He um, really um, increased the number of navigational aids um, while at the same time decreasing the number of personnel at, at those uh, light stations. So a lot of the nav navigational aids that he was responsible for included, included things like lighted buoys and things that didn't necessarily have to have a person to uh, maintain or operate them. Uh, then finally, in 1939, uh, there was a governmental consolidation by Franklin, by President Franklin Roosevelt, and the Bureau of Lighthouses became part of the U.S. Coast Guard, and that is where our aids to navigation uh, programs remain to this day under the United States Coast Guard, and also Michigan remains in the ninth district of the Coast Guard. So the images we have on this screen on the lower left, we have, um, this is a label from uh, Lighthouse Library. So when um, the, especially for the remote lighthouses, the lighthouse establishment created these uh, traveling libraries, which were basically three by three wooden boxes that they filled with books that they would um, drop off at the different light stations. So the light keepers and their families would have reading material. And so they would switch these boxes out every so often um, to change out the reading material for um, those keepers and their families. Uh, in the middle photo, this is the original uh, keepers dwelling at Whitefish Point. And you can see kind of the de deteriorated condition. Um, this no longer exists, but this I think helps to illustrate kind of the condition of those early lighthouses uh, and why many of them were replaced um, shortly after or uh, you know, not long after they were constructed and occupied. And then here we have the logo from the United States Lighthouse Service. And then finally the logo from the United States Coast Guard. So there were certain lighthouse types that became common and also um, many lighthouse materials that were used to, to construct our light station uh, buildings. So these are not complete lists, but they kind of give you the common, more of the common lighthouse types and common materials that were used. So in, in Michigan at the lower left, we have uh, uh, an example. This is an octagonal tower attached to the corner of the keeper's quarters. This is the Eagle Harbor Lighthouse uh, in Eagle Harbor, Michigan. And then here we have a cylindrical, round or cylindrical style light tower. And this is at the St. James Harbor on Beaver Island. Unfortunately, this is the only structure left from the light station itself. Everything else had been, has been demolished. There are still a few buildings from the life-saving uh, station there. And this is a brick, painted brick tower. Here we have the Whitefish Point Tower, which is a skeletal type tower made of uh, steel and cast iron. On the upper right, we have the Mission Point Lighthouse, a wood structure. And then lower right is the North Manitou Shoal Light in Lake Michigan, steel structure. But as you can see, all of these combine various materials. The predominant materials um, are, as I mentioned, um, you know, brick or steel, but they all combined multiple materials. So for example, in North, the North uh, Manitou Shoal Light, you have a concrete base or pier, you have a steel structure, you have the cast iron lantern at the top with glass. Um, and of course, interior materials were uh, varied as well. But that gives you a sample of the lighthouse types and uh, materials that were common. <clears throat> in addition to the light tower and the keeper's quarters itself, we often had um, accessory buildings or, or outbuildings that made a complete a lighthouse complex. And these kind of came and went over time, right? As needs arose, we uh, saw the installation and building of, of different structures. Um, and then sometimes as they became obsolete, we saw them removed or demolished. But just uh, some examples of those other buildings that we see on light station sites. Uh, we have assistant light keepers quarters. Oftentimes as the station grew and became more important or expanded in, in what they were providing, such as a fog signal, they needed additional assistance uh, and appointed assistant keepers. And so those keepers and families needed places to stay. So here in the upper right, we have a fog signal building. This is at the Point Betsy Light Station. The lower right, we have the assistant keeper's quarters at the Huron Island Light Station. Um, middle upper, we have a barn or storage building. This is a very typical standardized design, this barn or storage type building. This one has been modified a bit, but um, that was um, kind of typical uh, installation at many light stations. 
oil storage building for storage of flammable materials that they didn't want to store in the lighthouse itself. And of course, the all-important privy. This is a privy at uh, 40 Mile Point Light Station. And then other sort of site features, sidewalk development early on, sidewalks were wood, but they were later replaced by uh, concrete. And then again, if it was a family station at a site, there would often be um, gardens, fruit trees, other things that the uh, light, light keepers family uh, would plant to supplement their diets um, in, in the adjacent uh, light station yard. So those were all kind of buildings that, that over time accumulated and added to make a complete light station site and to help them become uh, self-sufficient. Now, of course, we have to talk about the lens, right? That's the whole reason for these structures being there is the light in the lens. So early on in the lighthouse establishment under, that, under the administration of Stephen Pleasanton, the dominant type of light that we saw was what you see here was a, a, an oil lamp that had a reflector behind it. So the oil lamp then in the light source would be reflected out across the water um, for the mariners. Now this was developed, um, there's some debate as to exactly who credit, where the credit goes for the development of this light. Um, it's between a Swiss uh, physicist, Ami Argand and uh, Winslow Lewis, an American. Um, but Argand was uh, known for developing a hollow wick, which increased the intensity of the burning flame. So that is attributed to him. And then uh, both uh, he and, and Lewis uh, develop, developed these uh, reflectors uh, with these lamps to help increase the intensity of the light. And in some cases, there were multiple lights and reflectors that were used at the same location to, again, increase the intensity of that light. Um, story goes that Pleasanton and Lewis were friends. And of course, with uh, Pleasanton's um, highest priority being fiscal responsibility, he maintained and installed uh, the Lewis type lamps in uh, lighthouses up through 1852. So of course, Lewis benefited from that. He, was also, he also benefited from co constructing many lighthouses. Um, but then toward the end of, of uh, Pleasanton's administration, there were a lot of complaints about the administration, the quality of lights, the quality of lighthouses and structures. So that's when we saw that change to the lighthouse board. And at that time, as I mentioned with um, the board looking at technological, technological um, advancements in the lighthouses in the US, they started to adopt a different form of lens. And what we see here at the bottom is the Fresnel lens. This was developed by Augustin Fresnel in 1822, and they were being used in European lighthouses after that point, 1822. So we knew in the US, we knew these, these lenses were being used and they were far superior in, in light quality and distance. And so after uh, the board came in to um, take over the, the lighthouse establishment, we saw many of these light Fresnel lenses being installed. Probably the most common one would be the fourth order lens here. There are six orders. Um, and then of course, over time, uh, these became, um, you know, they, they require a lot of maintenance and with advancements in technology now, we saw these replaced by more modern acrylic and LED lenses. And so these have essentially become museum pieces uh, that we see at uh, many of our light station sites that operate as museums. So that puts us into sort of the, the larger national context. So what was Michigan doing uh, during all this? Well, Michigan, as we know, is bordered by four of the five Great Lakes, uh, which gives us over 3,200 miles of shoreline. This is the most of any state except Alaska. So combining the length of shoreline with the increase, significant increase in maritime traffic in the 19th century, that resulted in many lighthouses being built around the state of Michigan on our shores and in our waters. Um, so as a result today, we can probably say that Michigan has more lighthouses than any other state. We count um, over 120 light, historic lighthouses in Michigan. Uh, every year to help promote our historic lighthouses, we produce a historic lighthouses of Michigan map, which you see on the left, and a series of postcards to highlight some of our unique Michigan lighthouses. Um, I do, we do print these uh, annually, and I do have copies from last year here in our office. If any of you would like hard copies of these, please um, let me know. You can send me your name and mailing address. And I think, Mallory, if you want to pop my um, email address into the chat box, everyone will have that. It's B at michigan.gov. <clears throat> and then just to um, give you a few uh, 
bits of lighthouse trivia for Michigan. The first lighthouse built in Michigan was the Fort Gratiot Lighthouse. This was built in 1825. Again, going back to that Pleasanton era and poor quality construction, Fort Gratiot, the first lighthouse, was, was built poorly and in a poor location. It only stood for a couple of years before it, it uh, fell over. Then in 1829, a new lighthouse in a, in a better location was built, and that one was modified in the 1860s. So what you see today in Fort Gratiot is a combination of the 1829 tower and uh, later modifications. Uh, the Livingstone Memorial Lighthouse was built on Belle Isle in Detroit. This is named after William Livingstone, who was a prominent Detroit businessman, and he was also the president of the late Carriers, Carriers Association for many years. So he was well known in the maritime world and shipping industry. Um, and after he passed away, they wanted to build this memorial lighthouse in his honor. So it was built in 1930. The unique aspects about this lighthouse are that it is built of marble. It's the only lighthouse in the US built of marble. And it was also designed by the uh, well-known industrial architect, Albert Kahn. Um, so that's a, a unique uh, lighthouse aspect for Michigan. And then North Manitou Shoal. The North Manitou Shoal in Lake Michigan was initially marked by three different light ships over the course of 25 years. So that's a little bit of Michigan maritime history um, that's perhaps not as well known, that many of these shoals and shallow waters were marked by light ships that were anchored at the site. They would have a light at the top of one of their masts, and they often had fog signal buildings on, on the ship as well. So um, North Manitou Shoal had one of those um, for 25 years. Um, it's a small photograph, but if you look in the slide, this is uh, nearing construction of the North Manitou Shoal light. And here you can see this little dot back here in the background. That is the light ship that marked the shoal. So it's a rare photograph um, that includes the light ship, which is still operating at the same time the lighthouse was nearing, construction was nearing completion and before it was lit. Um, and then North Manitou Shoal light, it was also the last manned light uh, on the Great Lakes. And that was um, uh, 1980 when personnel were taking off that light. So who owns Michigan lighthouses? Um, there's a variety of ownership types in Michigan. Uh, of course, they were all built and initially owned by the federal government. Um, but as they became obsolete or were no longer needed, they were transferred out of federal government ownership. We have a handful that are owned by the state of Michigan by DNR. We have several owned by local governments and nonprofit organizations, and then some are also owned by individuals. On the lower right, we have the Eagle Harbor rear range light. This was transferred early on out of federal government, and now it's in private ownership and used as a summer residence in Eagle Harbor. Here we have the South Haven light, pier light. The tower itself is owned by the Historical Association of South Haven. They acquired that from the federal government. The catwalk, which is one of only four remaining in Michigan, is owned by the city of South Haven, and the pier is owned by the Corps of Engineers, so kind of a combination of ownership uh, here at this one. Big Sable is owned by Michigan DNR, um, operated and maintained by a nonprofit group, the Sable Points Light Keepers Association. They actually uh, maintain and operate four lights on the, on the uh, West Coast. Um, so again, a partnership operation there for Big Sable. And then out here on the right, we have unfortunately uh, what has become an orphan lighthouse. This is the Waugashants light in Lake Michigan, um, maybe 12, 14 miles west of the Mackinac Bridge. Um, this is kind of a, uh, it has kind of a little bit of a sad history. It's a very active light. It was the first light built in open water in Michigan. Um, it was decommissioned in 1913 when the White Shoal light was built a little further out into the lake. So that was, it became obsolete. Then during, because it was abandoned and obsolete during World War II, it was actually used for um, target practice by the US military. Um, there are actually video clips of, of um, them testing drone type air, airplanes and dropping bombs on Wagashans. So unfortunately, the, as a result of that, the entire interior was burned and it was kind of left as a ruin. It was taken over from the federal government by, by the Wagashans uh, Lighthouse Group, nonprofit group. Unfortunately, because of the you know, um, difficulty of getting to it as an offshore light um, and difficulty in raising funds for rehab, their uh, organization recently dissolved. And so we're um, looking at uh, what to, to do with the uh, Wagashans Lighthouse. <clears throat> so we do have um, a number of programs uh, 
a couple of programs uh, in the SHPO that are directly connected to um, our lighthouses. So I'll touch on each of these a little bit. First is uh, section 106 that I've mentioned of the National Historic Preservation Act. So any property or project that has federal involvement or a federal license or money, that project goes through a review through our office to make a determination on any negative impacts on historic resources. We also have a historic preservation easement program. These easements provide protective language um, for historic resources. They're recorded with the property deed. And basically what they say is that any work or projects that happen on these historic sites will be reviewed and approved through the SHPO before the work takes place. So it's a way of protecting those properties uh, in perpetuity in most cases. We currently hold over 70 easements for lighthouse properties. And finally, financial incentives. Um, a lot of our financial incentives will require us to review the project, again, to ensure that it's compliant with the standards we use to um, guide these projects. Um, just wanted to share with you a little bit about Gull Rock Lighthouse that you see in these photographs. This one does have uh, easement language in its, in its uh, quick claim deed, so that's why we are involved with Gull Rock. Um, I, I really like this historic photograph of it. It's a very clear photograph, but it kind of gives you a glimpse into the daily life at a life station, uh, light station. Off to the left, you can see the laundry hanging out. So it's laundry day at Gull Rock. Uh, on the far right, you see a fish, fishing net here by the boathouse. Um, and then connecting, this is, it's literally a rock in Lake Superior. Connecting this laundry area and the outhouse, we have these wooden walkways to make for a smooth walking area to, to those um, areas. And then you can see, if you blow up this photo, there's a man, and it looks like a child standing out on the stoop, kind of looking out to see who's coming to visit them, or maybe if they knew who was coming, uh, waiting for their visitors, visitors to arrive at the dock. Um, so this is an aerial view of Gull Rock. We had a grant a few years ago to help them replace the roof on the lighthouse and the privy. Um, but I guess I will share that this is probably my favorite uh, light station privy in the state of Michigan. So you can say it's the best lighthouse outhouse. Uh, and the reason is, um, you can see how close it is to the shoreline here and the waves lapping up at, at its base. In this photograph, you can see it was constructed, the stone foundation was constructed with two holes, one on either side, one on the north, one on the south. This on the north is a little bit higher, the one on the south is a little bit lower. So as waves come up, they wash in, come in this hole, wash everything out through the bottom hole and clean out the privy vault. So kind of a simple but clever design to keep that uh, privy vault cleaned out and one less maintenance item for the light keepers at Gull Rock. So a couple of examples of 106 projects. Uh, here we have the Point Iroquois Lighthouse on Lake Superior. Uh, we just completed a review of a project there to remove the paint from the tower, replace deteriorated brick and repoint, and then repaint the entire tower. Um, here on the left, we have the Grand Haven South Pier Lights. This was recently awarded a Michigan um, Coastal Zone Management Grant or Coastal, I think it's called Coastal Management Program Grant recently to help secure their tower from their lantern room from uh, water infiltration. And so we reviewed that project. And then the upper right, we also kind of review smaller type installation projects. You can see a, a lens here installed on the railing of the lantern room. We have a small solar panel. And then um, this um, pole here probably holds an anemometer or other weather monitoring equipment probably pl placed by, the, by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So again, federal um, installations, we would review those. And usually if they're temporary, we consider these temporary or not permanent and reversible um, and not too much of a visual impact, those are typically approved. Under historic preservation easements, a couple of examples. We have on the lower left, the St. Joseph Pier Lights. Um, again, these were transferred, I believe in 2013. Uh, and the quick claim deed uh, includes that protective language. And then on the right, the Gross Eel North Channel range light. This was transferred early, so we don't have that same kind of protective language in the deed, but we did give them a grant and executed a preservation easement several years ago. Um, it's a beautiful little wooden structure, and I love the interior shot of that uh, wooden spiral wooden staircase there. Um, and here, I realized last night when Mallory sent me the sponsors for today that both of these lighthouses were, the architect for both of these projects was Michelle Smay from Smay Trombley. So a shout out to Michelle Smay for her work on our lighthouses and thanks again for sponsoring um, the session this afternoon. Um, financial incentives, of course, you know, um, 
is kind of an, an endless need for financial resources for our historic lighthouses. But we do have several programs um, available for Michigan Lights. This is not by any means a complete list, but some of the more common granting sources we've seen. We have the Michigan Department of Transportation, Transportation Alternatives Program money. This has been awarded only a few times to lighthouse projects that I'm aware of, but um, it's, it can be big money. I mean, it can go into the several hundred thousands of dollars. Um, we have the Michigan Coastal Management Program, which I just mentioned, Grand Haven recently received one of those. Again, a handful of lighthouses over the past few years have received these. National Maritime Heritage Grant Program has been uh, around since 1999. Unfortunately, they've only had about four or five grant rounds over those years. We did receive one from Michigan um, a couple of years ago. So that's one to keep an eye on to see when they're gonna have their next grant round. The United States Lighthouse Society has a small grant program. I know last year, 2020, they gave several $1,000 grants to, to Michigan Lighthouses to assist them with operational and administrative costs during the pandemic last year. And then the Michigan Lighthouse uh, Program grants, which I'll talk about in more detail in a few minutes. This is the Detour Reef Light, Lake Huron. They received a MDOT grant uh, several years ago for their rehab. This is the Thunder Bay Island Light. They had a MLAP grant to replace the red metal roof and a Lighthouse Society grant to repair the lantern. And then St. Helena uh, is cur currently has an MLAP grant to do uh, tower work. So a little bit more about the Michigan Lighthouse Assistance Program, MLAP. Um, in 2000, the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act was passed. This was an amendment to that 1966 National Historic Preservation Act. And the purpose of the NHLPA was to help facilitate the transfer of many lighthouses out of federal ownership into local ownership. Coast Guard was realizing they could no longer maintain all of these and there really wasn't necessarily a functional need for them as much anymore, even though they maintain lights and many of those still maintain lights in many of these towers. So it was a way to um, help facilitate that transfer of those um, lighthouses. So on the state side, Michigan created the Michigan Lighthouse Assistance Program, MLAP. Um, when that program was created, a grant program was also put into place with it. So since uh, 2000, when that program was put into place, we've had uh, these grants. And this is the only grant source in Michigan, the continuous annual grant source strictly for Michigan's lighthouses. Um, stewards are eligible to apply for grants anywhere from $10,000 to $60,000. They can be for planning or rehabilitation. Planning grants could be things like a historic structures report or plans and specifications for a major rehabilitation project. And then of course, bricks and mortar projects um, are also eligible. They do re our rehabilitation projects do require historic preservation easement. So that's how we acquired many of those easements was through our grant program. Um, we do require compliance with the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. These are the guidelines that we use to review these projects. And I'll have an example in a few minutes of how those are applied. It is a reimbursement grant program. So uh, the stewards have to have 100% of the funding available in cash for the entire project. Uh, and then at the end of the project, once everything's complete, then we reimburse them for the grant amount. Privately owned resources are not eligible. So these are just for the government or nonprofit owned lighthouses. And we do require a project sign because we want to build awareness of our program and uh, let people know that partial funding for the project comes from uh, the Save Our Lights program. This is the website for the Save Our Lights page where you can find more information about our projects, including the um, grant application and the um, lighthouse and postcards I mentioned earlier, you can find them there in PDF form as well. A uh, couple other points uh, to share with you about the grant program. The applications are due at, in November of each year. Uh, and then we have an internal review committee for um, scoring those and choosing the ones that we're going to award. I believe it was two weeks ago, we announced our 2021 uh, awardees, and those include the North Manitou Shoal Light, which you see here, um, also includes Chris Point Lighthouse on Lake Superior, and the third one is Fort Gratiot that I mentioned we talked about earlier. Um, all projects have to be competitively bid, so we like to have that transparent and competitive bid process. 
Um, all lighthouses have to be national register listed or eligible. And essentially all of our historic lighthouses because of their importance for our maritime history are eligible for the national register. So that, that's not a um, huge hurdle for our, our lighthouses to apply. Um, and then just, I wanted to mention our grants manager here at SHPO is Joelle Letts and she's a great contact as well for assistance with uh, the grant program. Our grant program is solely funded with the proceeds from the sale of the Save Our Lights license plate. This is the state of Michigan fundraising plate, which was uh, first issued in 2001. You can see the two versions, two designs we've had so far. The, the first design at the bottom left uh, features the white, uh, white show lighthouse. Uh, and then we have more of a stylized lighthouse on the um, current uh, plate that you can see there at the bottom. So if you were to thank you to any of you out there who currently have a lighthouse license plate, um, those of you that don't and have a interest in Michigan's lighthouses, I'd encourage you to consider getting one. $25 from each license plate goes directly into the fund when it's purchased and then $10 from the renewal annual renewal every year goes back into the fund. So that's, that's the, the strictly the only source of funding for this MLEP grant program. We raise approximately $120,000 each year uh, for the program. That's the amount we bring in. So we try to grant out that amount every year. Since 2000, we've um, awarded over 2.5 million in grants. That has resulted in over 3.75 million total invested just through the MLEP grant program because there is a match required, a 50% match. So if a um, steward is awarded $60,000, they're required to match with 30,000 making a $90,000 project. And this of course does not include all the um, financial investment that our stewards and nonprofits and other organizations make toward our lighthouses. So overall total investment in our lights is, is much greater than that. And here we have a photograph again of the gross eel light with our uh, project sign and uh, some of the folks from the gross eel light um, after that project was completed. So the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties are the guidelines that we use to review all historic um, rehabilitation projects. There are actually four standards. Um, those four uh, sets of standards are for preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, and reconstruction. So there are differences between the, the four approaches. Um, the uh, treatment approach that we use is the standards for rehabilitation. So those standards kind of acknowledge that pro properties are gonna change over time and in order to be continually used, um, but that we wanna retain their historic character when those changes are made. So in contrast, for example, restoration standards would be taking a property or building back to a specific period in time and making it look and function as it was during that very specific period in time. Whereas with rehabilitation, we might um, install modern technology, modern conveniences, um, but keep the overall characteristics of that uh, historic resource. On the far right, we have a photo of the Chris Point Lighthouse on Lake Superior, uh, having some masonry work done um, and complying with the standards. We want the, the new repointing mortar to match the historic mortar. We wanna make sure the paint, is, paint coatings are not detrimental to the, the historic brick or historic masonry. So those are the kinds of the things we look at uh, in this type of project. So there are 10 standards for rehabilitation. We're not gonna cover all 10, but I just wanted to summarize in a couple bullet points kind of what the overall intent is of those standards. Um, overall is that the historic character of the property should be preserved. We don't wanna do anything to damage or destroy that historic character. We wanna use the most general action or treatment on historic property. This is most often applied to stone or brick masonry. We don't want anything abrasive or anything that's gonna actually damage the stone or the brick if we're trying to clean it or remove paint. We want new material to match the old. So for example, if you're putting um, in replacement windows, we want those to match the design of the original. And repair rather than replace his, uh, deteriorated historic materials. So again, with windows, if they can be repaired rather than replaced, we'd like to keep that historic material in place. We also like the treatment to be rever reversible. So if we're doing perhaps an addition or a minor change. We want that to be reversible so that at some point someone could remove that uh, or make that change so that it goes reverts back to its original condition. And just a, a quick example here, this is the Point Betsy Lighthouse on Lake Michigan. Um, friends of Point Betsy have done a wonderful job in rehabbing the interior and exterior of the structures at the site. This is the tower and keepers quarters. Um, 
one of the items that they did when they did the rehabilitation was to replace the roof. It was an asphalt shingle roof. Of course, being on a very exposed point on Lake Michigan, they wanted the most durable and long lasting roof material. So they discussed, you know, asphalt shingles, uh, metal roof, but it came back to the wood shingle roof that you see here, stained wood shingle roof, because that was what was in place uh, historically on the lighthouse during its period of significance. So that what was that is what was put back on. It's held up incredibly well. Uh, they've had to restain at one time, but otherwise it's in, in good condition. Then if you um, look at the top of this chimney, you see these chimney pots that were installed. So when we reviewed this project, we thought, well, why, what are those on top of that chimney? Why are they doing that? They said, hey, we have these historic photographs showing those chimney pots and we wanna put them back on because we think they're, they're kind of cool and they were there historically. So they did that. And then here in the historic photograph, you see this little vestibule that led into the first floor of the keeper's quarters. In the rehab, they actually removed that and they rebuilt it so that it housed a handicap lift, an accessibility lift. So you enter it from the side here and it lifts you up into the first floor that you can, so you can have access to the museum on the first floor. You can see the sign here for handicap parking. So this is their access here. So it's a really good solution to getting more access to that uh, museum space at Point Betsy without compromising the integrity or making major uh, changes to the visual aspects of the lighthouse. So just a couple um, ideas on how those standards are applied. So two um, uh, sort of case study examples of lighthouses that we've been involved with uh, recently through <clears throat> uh, our grant program. So this is uh, Standard Rock, which is in Lake Superior. This is kind of a fascinating light and an interesting story because it's you know literally in the middle of, of Lake Superior. So this uh, lighthouse was completed in 1878, took several years to complete. Um, it is the North American light station most distant from land. It's about 25 miles east of the tip of the Keweenaw Peninsula and about 42 miles north of Marquette. Um, it was in August of 1853 that navigator Captain Charles C. Stannard was sailing across Lake, St lake uh, Superior when he saw something in the middle of the lake. So approaching it at first, he thought it may be the hull of an overturned ship or boat. So he cautiously appro approached it um, and eventually realized he was coming upon a shoal. So he was able to back out of that. Um, and from that point on, 1835, it was a noted hazard in the middle of Lake Superior. And then in 1855, we have the um, installation of the first lock at Sault Ste. Marie. So that significantly increased maritime traffic across Lake Superior. So that kind of increased the need for something to mark that shoal in the middle of Lake Superior. So then of course, um, eventually it was the Standard Rock light was approved for construction and was built as you see in this photograph on the left from 1912. So because of its uh, remote location and um, you cannot see land from this, this uh, lighthouse, old time light, he, lighthouse keepers called it the loneliest place in North America. And modern day US Coast Guardsmen labeled it stranded rock. Uh, and rumored it was a punishment tour of duty, as in, if you screw up badly enough in the ninth district, they will send your butt out to stranded rock. Um, so that was a form of punishment seen uh, by many in the Coast Guard at that time. Um, and you can see why. Again, you can't see land if you're stationed out here for a couple of weeks. Um, you're, you're sort of um, isolated in this tower with perhaps two other um, Coast Guardsmen. Um, and there's really, <laughs> there's really no space. I mean, you can't even make a complete lap and walk around uh, the, the base of the pier because of the fog signal building here. So um, for several reasons, it was uh, it got those uh, that reputation. Um, it was also known as a stag station, which meant that uh, wives or children were not allowed to be stationed there with light keepers, again, for obvious reasons, I think. Um, unfortunately, this kind of had a, a tragic ending, at least for its occupancy. In 1961, there were three keepers stationed here. Um, another Coast Guardsman was on site doing repair work to some machinery in the Fog Signal Building. And unfortunately, um, there was a massive explosion in the Fog Signal Building. Um, the Coast Guardsman working here um, was never found. Uh, the three in the tower survived and they uh, stayed out on the pier deck for I think it was two or three days before they were, they were rescued. And the flames from that, that explosion of fire were so intense, you can see here there's still scars on the uh, stone walls of Lighthouse Tower from where that, that, that intense heat um, um, scarred the stone walls there. Um, here uh, in this 1922 photograph of 
in, from April 1922, we see a photograph of um, the lighthouse with uh, encased in ice and a note here that their 40 foot launch is embedded in what they call the iceberg. Um, so uh, probably several more, more weeks till that ice melted off. Um, and then here are two photographs from 1954 showing uh, the light uh, keepers uh, leaving the, the, the light at the end of the season in 1954 in November. So literally, literally their, their, um, their case of individual you know, belongings were hoisted over the side into the, into the boat and into the tender. And then you climb down the ladder and go home, uh, go home for, the, for the season. So um, very isolated, perhaps challenging, mentally challenging. <laughs> Uh, to be stationed here, no radio, no TV, no phones, no cell phones, no iPads, iPods, computers. Um, maybe your your lighthouse uh, library was kept you entertained, and maybe a deck of cards to play with your fellow uh, keepers. So this was a 2013 NHLPA transfer, um, so that protective language was included in the deed. And then we also had a 2015 MLAP planning grant with them, where we did a historic structures report. Second project is the Mission Point Lighthouse. This one was built in 1870. And again, this site had changes over time with additional structures being added and moved or de uh, demolished on site. This is um, on the old Mission Peninsula north of Traverse City. We had a grant with them in 2018 to do some work at the Lantern Gallery and help uh, water waterproof that. 2010, we had a grant to do a historic structure report. And in 2015, we um, had a grant to do sort of a larger site project. And then I'll explain that a little bit here. This is a historic photograph, probably from the 1910s. The period of significance for Mission Point is, I believe, 1910 to 1920, somewhere in that time, time frame. So this photograph uh, is a really good source of information uh, for what it looked like at that time and what they were uh, what Peninsula Township, the owner, is trying to achieve in the look of the lighthouse. So this was this is a good photograph to, to use as a guide for what they were trying to accomplish there. So our 2015 grant was used to, you can see here the storage building adjacent to the kitchen addition here. You can see a little bit of that. Uh, and then the components here, two windows with a door in the middle and then a little vestibule and side door here. In 2016, you see those some of those elements missing and some of the changes that happened to this kitchen addition. So the 2015 grant helped move the storage building back to its original location next to the <clears throat> lean to kitchen addition. And this photograph is still uh, construction still in progress, so they're not quite completed. So that's why you don't see the full um, windows here or door, but they do match what we see in this historic photograph. Um, and the, the door and the storm door will be installed here as well as the shutters uh, to match what we say, see in this historic photograph. Um, so again, this was an early transfer to um, Peninsula Township, but they've been a great steward and done a great job of maintaining this um, and having it open for public and beautiful beach here uh, as well. All right, well, it's time to wrap it up already. Um, with all our Lighthouse talk this afternoon, I hope it has inspired you in some ways to see a light, stay at a light or support a light, um, or perhaps all three. Um, See a light, one good source of information for Michigan's lighthouses is the Pure Michigan website at michigan.org slash lighthouses. Uh, you can get some information about which ones you can visit and how you can visit them. Um, you can stay at a light. Several of our lighthouses have um, um, accommodations for overnight stays. Um, for example, the Sand Hills light has, is operated as sort of a bed and breakfast. So you simply reserve a room and can stay there. Others have keepers programs where you can stay anywhere from a weekend to um, two weeks. Some charge a fee um, and expect you to do some work, give tours, um, really be kind of a modern day lighthouse keeper. Um, a couple of years ago, I was fortunate enough to stay at Point Betsy with uh, two of my nephews and, and my niece. They have a the assistant keepers quarters here. They've rehabilitated into an apartment that they rent out for a week. You can rent it for a week during the summertime. So that was a great experience. Um, one thing I wasn't expecting was the popularity of the beach and the lighthouse there uh, at Point Betsy. There are always people around. Um, they're limited a little bit to the, to the light station site itself, but on the beach and on the concrete in front of the lighthouse, come to enjoy the beach and the water and beautiful sunsets uh, at Point Betsy. 
Um, another uh, lighthouse I've been fortunate enough to stay at is the Detour Reef, an offshore uh, lighthouse. They do have a weekend keepers program. Um, so again, great experiences if you're uh, interested in those. And supporting lights, uh, of course, I would encourage you to support all of Michigan's lights by getting a lighthouse license plate uh, if you don't already have one. Um, but also if you have a favorite lighthouse or you're visiting a lighthouse, please feel free. They're always um, um, very happy to receive monetary donations or if you have time to volunteer for an organization that's looking for volunteers, that really goes a long way to help Michigan's historic lights. Uh, and I think that is gonna wrap it up. I have contact information for Mallory and the Michigan Historic Preservation Network, as well as uh, my contact information at the State Historic Preservation Office. And this final photograph I just wanna share is the Huron Island Lighthouse. Um, beautiful lighthouse in a beautiful bluff, um, great setting if you ever have a chance to get out there and visit, that's another great one to see. Any of them that you can see and visit, they're all, they're all beautiful and uh, interesting in their own ways. So Mallory, I think uh, if you've got any, any questions, we can jump right in there. Yes, we are approaching two o'clock, but Brian has um, said that he is able to go over. So we have some questions, but if you need to hop off at two, um, again, if you could take the survey either um, directly after the webinar or when it goes out with the follow-up email, um, and there will be a link to the recording on YouTube that will be um, emailed out either tomorrow or Monday, depending on how long it takes to process. So do look for that. And if you need to hop off, feel free. But if you have a question, um, type that in and we'll just dive in. Um, so first question, with all of the privies on the lighthouse properties, has there been much historical archeological work done? Um, and it would be informative to see what was thrown out by those living in these most unusual lifestyles. <laughs> Right, that's a really good question. And I know there have been archeological um, archaeological digs done at lighthouse sites. Um, and, and of course the previous one um, target site where that would be done. I don't have any specific one in mind or know a lot of detail about any specific one. Um, we do have a staff archeologist here at, at SHPO and she's probably more familiar with, with those. Um, but, but yes, definitely um, we have had those done on various sites and I'm sure they have, they have um, produced, you know, significant uh, artifacts because that was, um, you know, place to throw garbage, of course, right? Um, but yeah, sorry, I don't have any, any real specific examples to share with you today. Um, and you kind of, you briefly mentioned this, there was a question about Lighthouse providing overnight accommodations. Um, so there are some that people could seek out to see if they can stay. Correct. Which is really unique. Um, does Michigan have a list of most threatened lighthouses? Most threatened? We do not. We do not. That again is um, kind of a good question. So I think you're probably thinking of um, a, a list similar to the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the 11 most endangered list. Um, and we don't. Um, I think, you know, we try to assist um, all of our lighthouses where we can. Of course, some of them, like the Walgashans example we saw, um, it's very difficult situation. So um, we don't have that sort of list, um, but I think you'll find, even if you just look at photographs or visit websites, you can see those which really do need um, perhaps more financial resources or more help than others. And those might be ones that you um, identify if you're looking to help support a lighthouse, uh, but we don't really maintain any, any sort of list or um, you know those that are in, in worse condition than others. Um, are there any climate change effects that you've begun to notice? Yeah, great question. So, um, you know, we know that the uh, Great Lakes water levels change over time, right? It's sort of a cyclical change in water levels. Um, but we have seen obviously high water levels for the last few years. So there is some um, concern with that in regards to lighthouses and light stations, which are you know, obviously near the water's edge in, in many cases. And actually the Michigan Lighthouse Alliance, which is a, a statewide nonprofit organization, they are putting on a conference this year, which I think Mallory MHPN is a sponsor or assisting with that. Mm -hmm. They have a virtual conference in um, June, early June, that's dealing specifically with some of the high water issues that our lighthouse stewards are having to deal with. So absolutely it's a concern. Um, I think for from the water le water level standpoint, as well as severe weather events, right, 
Um, we have, again, many of our lights in exposed locations where in a normal year or normal season, they take a beating um, with some more severe weather cycles. It's just gonna you know, increase the potential damage that they incur. So again, um, trying to address those where we can and um, you know, keep the lights in best condition that we can in working with the, the stewards and the owners. Is, is our approach right now. But I think that that um, MLA conference will be good in June to help address and bring out some of the questions or issues that 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 stewards are currently facing. Right, right. The the impacts on our shoreline um, with that those fluctuating lake lake levels has been pretty Right. The other thing we're seeing, and we've reviewed a few projects this past year, is increasing um, or changing seawalls or increasing uh, the amount of riprap rocks to protect lighthouses. I mean, you know, Chris Point is an example where you look at an aerial photo of that and you have this land point of land kind of projecting out into the lake and then this riprap rock protecting that. So it really shows you the amount of, of erosion over time that's happened around um, some of these um, sites specifically. Right, right. Um, we did, MHPN did a, a webinar last June talking about um, our coastal resources and um, discussing archaeological and, and some of our lighthouse um, resources being impacted by those, those changing water um, levels. So those are all housed on our YouTube channel if you're interested in, in learning more um, specifically about that, that topic. Um, Brian, do you have any familiarity uh, about uh, Black or Native American light keepers? You know, that's a really good question. And um, I, well, just to start, first of my answer to that question. So there, there were many um, women lighthouse keepers as well. So I don't want to give the impression when we say light keeper, that was is strictly men, certainly predominantly men. Um, but there were many um, light, women lighthouse keepers and uh, assistant keepers. Um, so for example, at Gull Rock, we have very limited uh, living quarter space. Um, after some time, they decided to make the wife of the keeper the assistant keeper. And so she received a salary because it just made sense given the conditions at that particular site. So many um, women light keepers in Michigan's lighthouse history as well. Um, no, I don't know of any sort of, you know, minority or uh, other kind of represented um, groups that had light keepers. I, I don't. That'd be a que question, interesting question for uh, nationally too for lighthouses, any lighthouses across the nation. Um, so I, I'm not aware of any in Michigan specifically. Um, I don't know. Um, good, good topic for research, I suppose. Right, right. Um, we did have um, a, a couple FYIs that came in. Um, so there are volunteer keeper programs at St. Helena Island and at Sheboygan Riverfront Range Light. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And then um, additionally, the Sand Hills um, light has been closed for visitors for a few years due uh, to renovations. Okay. Um, so Good yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, and then there's there's a question about the 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 grant requirement um, in the in how to to match. Um, can you? provide a response to that that's in the chat okay so um, for um for the mlap grants um we we do require that 50 percent match so it's 50 percent of the grant amount so that example if you apply for the maximum amount of sixty thousand dollars for re a rehabilitation project 50 percent of that sixty thousand would be thirty thousand so your over total project cost would be 90,000. So that's how that match works. And again, you have to have that total 90,000 to do the project. And then we would reimburse the 60,000 after the project is complete. Um, some projects of course will go over that amount. And so anything above the 30% match that you would provide would, we would be considered overmatch and certainly fine to spend more on a project. Um, but the minimum is that $30,000 cash match for the $60,000 MLAP grant dollars. I hope that answers your question. If not, you know, ask, you can ask okay. us for clarification. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna type something up. Um,
All right. Um, so that was that was all the questions that we had. A lot of really good discussion um, about you know a really unique resource um, to Michigan. Uh, how how many amazing uh, coast coastline miles we have, how many lighthouses and and um, life saving stations that we have across the across the state. And it's um, as a Michigander, it's definitely iconic. Um, so Brian, thank you so much for your time today and sharing um, the the programs that the State Historic Preservation Office offers for the lighthouses, um, and for being here to ask answer any questions and for sharing your contact information. So a reminder, if you had forgotten, the, there are those postcards and maps. So if you'd like a copy, um, keep Brian's uh, email address and he's been so kind to, to offer to send those out to individuals um, at, as requested. Um, again, before we uh, wrap up, uh, we wanna thank our sponsors today, the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Trust for Historic Preservation and Bayview Handiworks and Smay Trombley Architecture. Thank you so much for helping uh, keep these programs going. Our next webinar is May 6th, so just a few weeks away, and we'll be uh, discussing um, timber structures and evaluating timber structures. So registration is open for that at our website, um, www.mhpn.org backslash workshops um, and we hope we will see you all there brian do you have any uh closing remarks that you'd like to to say before we head out well just one more thing to throw out there the michigan lighthouse guide is planning a michigan lighthouse festival this august um, at the mission point lighthouse so um, traverse city so that's an event that was delayed from last year mission point it was celebrating its 150th anniversary last year it was built in 1870 so um Speaking of my example of Mission Point, I, I, I was reminded of that, so I just wanted to throw that out there. You can look for information on that if you're interested. Um, and um, support our lighthouses this summer, go out and visit, and drop your dollars in their donation box. So thank you all for um, attending this afternoon. Thanks for having me, Mallory. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And the Michigan Lighthouse Alliance Conference is June 3rd through 4th, and our conference, I would be remiss in uh, mentioning it, is uh, May 11th through 15th and registration is open. There are also scholarships available. I will drop the website in real quick into the chat because we would love to have you join us. We have a great lineup. Um, so uh, again, thank you all for joining us and we look forward to catching you all in the future. Have a good afternoon.